If you were put in charge of developing America's next air superiority fighter, an aircraft purpose-built to dominate the skies over even the most hotly contested war zones of the 21st century, how would you go about doing it? What systems, capabilities, and cutting-edge technologies would you build this new fighter around? Let's find out. Let's dive into the best fighter technologies in the world today. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Before we dive into what could end up being a pretty long video, I want to take a second to highlight the incredible artwork of Rodrigo Avella, which we used in the thumbnail for this video, and you can find all throughout our write-up on Sandbox News. Rodrigo is the same guy who did the incredible NGAD artwork for my cover of Popular Mechanics last summer, and he was kind enough to let us use some of his artwork for this story here. Make sure to give him a follow on Twitter and Instagram, and check out his website to see more of his awesome work. With that said, let's dive in, because last week I had to take a bit of an impromptu vacation when I went blind in my left eye. I had to go in for some emergency surgery, but I'm doing very well. I'm not all the way out of the woods yet, but the prognosis is very good, and I was stuck without the ability to look at screens for a few days, which, for a guy like me, was torture. So I pulled out my trusty notebook and started making a list of all of the publicly disclosed programs developing new fighter technologies that I would cram into the fuselage of a next-generation air superiority fighter. And that's exactly what we've got here. This is hypothetical, but I'll be assembling the latest and most advanced systems that are currently either being fielded or are in development and could potentially find their way into a fighter in a reasonable time frame. In other words, because this new jet needs to start flying in the next five to 10 years, holding out for cold fusion or even a fully dual cycle scramjet system just isn't very feasible. But advanced jet engines like GE's XA100, which hasn't found its way into a fighter but is being tested, are totally fair game. I'll also be pulling from some slightly more hypothetical concepts that could certainly find their way into a new fighter, despite not being the subject of any currently publicly disclosed programs, things like active flow control, which we'll get into later. And where better to start than with the aircraft's overall design, which would be a Delta-like wing with no vertical tail surfaces. America's next air superiority fighter will need to be able to dominate the skies, but to be fair, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to do it in the same fashion we've come to expect from high-performance fighters. The days of acrobatic close-quarters dogfights are widely believed to be over, thanks to the advent of beyond-visual-range sensors and very capable long-range air-to-air weapons. In other words, this new fighter doesn't need to be as capable up close as a Su-35 or an F-22 in order to do the job but it does need to be highly survivable in contested airspace while winning fights against the most capable fighters the world has to offer. Variations on the Delta Wing have seen successful use in a number of modern European fighters, as well as experimental use in efforts to increase the capabilities of jets like the F-16 in the F-16XL and the F-22 Raptor in the FB-22. The added area of the Delta Wing dramatically increases the aircraft's lift, improving payload capabilities and range, while also offering more space for fuel storage, which further increases either range or loiter time. Like all stealth aircraft, weapons would have to be carried internally when prioritizing stealth, but I'd expect a slightly larger fuselage than we find in the F-22 to allow for greater internal storage, though the aircraft will also benefit from using drones to deliver ordnance as well. Leveraging active flow control, which we'll talk about more later, with the aircraft's propulsion systems could eliminate the need for many or maybe even all of the traditional control surfaces that fighters rely on. In particular, this would allow the aircraft to do away with standing vertical tails, and those can really compromise a stealth jet's profile. Although a lot of people don't realize it, stealth fighters like the F-22 and F-35 are visible on lower-spectrum radar arrays that serve as pretty effective early warning systems. 
but a design that leans more toward the flying wings of the B-2 Spirit and B-21 Raider could help delay detection from even these systems. Up next is propulsion, and the advanced new adaptive cycle engines currently seeing successful tests under both GE and Pratt & Whitney banners, the XA100 and XA101 respectively, are the easy favorites to meet the needs of America's next air superiority fighter. These engines produce more thrust and power than previous power plants, while also offering a huge leap in fuel economy and heat management. And that matters because that allows for greater electrical production. The XA100 is rated for 45,000 pounds of thrust under afterburner, which would give a two-engine design a whopping 90,000 pounds of thrust on tap, or about 20,000 more than the F-22 gets from its two Pratt & Whitney F-119 PW100s. But that's just the beginning of what makes these engines special. The XA100 interprets pilot input to operate in different modes. When the pilot needs the engine's peak performance in combat, he or she can lead hard on the throttle and the engine's management system will take its cue to switch into heavy burning high thrust mode. Conversely, while on patrol, the engine could stay in its high efficiency low burning mode and stretch out its mileage or its loiter time. I had a chance to talk to the folks at GE about this engine last year, and they told me that their most recent tests showed 20% more thrust across most of the flight profile and as much as 50% more fuel economy over the F-35's existing Pratt & Whitney F-135 PW100s. But maybe just as importantly, it also offers double the thermal management. Now, the heat produced by modern jet engines is actually a limiting factor in their ability to produce power for onboard systems. As these engines burn hotter, they actually run the risk of damaging the aircraft itself. But adaptive cycle engines like GE's XA100 manage that heat better, and that allows for more electrical production, which we would need to power advanced countermeasures and directed energy weapons. While we're discussing propulsion, let's dive into active flow and thrust vector control. Because maybe the biggest departure my design would make from the fighters in the sky today is a concerted effort to incorporate active flow control alongside thrust vectoring to dramatically reduce the need for radar reflecting control surfaces without sacrificing maneuverability. In effect, these systems allow the aircraft to change direction without the traditional moving parts like flaps or ailerons that we've come to expect. One approach to this technology discussed in the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics is routing puffs of air from the aircraft's jet engines through specific holes in the fuselage to alter its trajectory in flight. It's basically a really advanced and high-speed approximation of how you might see a spacecraft adjust positioning in orbit, but use on an aircraft would require much more precise and powerful execution. Another approach, published in the Journal of Applied Physics, calls for using an array of electrodes on the skin of the aircraft, fuselage, and wings. These electrodes would produce an electrical discharge at specific intervals and locations, which would quickly heat up the air nearby, changing its density and, in turn, how it affects the flight of the aircraft as it passes over, under, or through it. Now, as crazy as that might sound, there have been similar systems in use for decades now. Jump jets like the AV-8B Harrier have long used a reaction control system that works under a similar principle during vertical takeoffs and landings. But it wasn't until recently that technology made this approach feasible for this sort of application without drawing too much power away from the aircraft's primary propulsion. The power surplus allowed by the XA-100's improved thermal management might also help make these systems more possible. My fighter would also leverage thrust vector control, which allows the pilot to aim the outflow of thrust from the engines, independent of the aircraft itself, using nozzles. America's F-22 already has 180-degree thrust vector control up and down vertically, while some other jets, like Russia's Su-35, have 360-degree thrust vector control where the nozzles can aim literally anywhere. Depending on how effective the active flow control system incorporated into this new jet design works, 
A 360 degree thrust vector control nozzle on the engines could supplement the aircraft's control, alongside a minimal number of conventional control surfaces if they're needed. Because active flow control systems use fewer moving parts, that would mean a reduction in both maintenance costs and in the number of seams and gaps in the aircraft's body that can compromise its stealth signature. As you may be aware, current stealth fighters cover all of these seams and gaps with radar-absorbent materials. A lot of times, it's radar-absorbent tape. The fewer gaps in an aircraft's body, the more stealthy it can be. If a tail does ultimately prove necessary, because the active flow control system just isn't capable enough to eliminate vertical tails completely, a stealthy angled tail, sort of like what we saw in the YF-23, could be incorporated without doing too much damage to the overall stealth design we're going for. And since we're talking about how to make this new fighter stealthier than ever, now seems like a good time to discuss the use of ceramic radar-absorbent materials that will both improve stealth and supersonic performance. Modern stealth aircraft leverage radar-reflecting designs that are meant to deflect electromagnetic waves away from the aircraft, rather than directly back at the receiver. But these designs alone aren't enough to make a modern jet truly stealth. They're also covered in layers of radar-absorbent materials that dramatically reduce their radar returns. This radar-absorbent material, or RAM, used by modern American fighters, has been rated to absorb upwards of 70 to 80 percent of inbound electromagnetic energy, or radar waves. But it's also really expensive and time-consuming to maintain. In fact, that's a really big part of the huge expense associated with operating both the F-22 and the F-35. Current radar-absorbing materials are also really susceptible to damage caused by heat, which is a big problem at supersonic speeds. In fact, the risk of damaging this material in the tail section specifically of the F-35C has limited the aircraft's supersonic capabilities to short sprints of just under 60 seconds. Last year, however, a research team out of North Carolina State University, led by Cheng Ying, or Cheryl Zhu, announced the development of a new ceramic-based radar-absorbent material that could be used for tactical fighter applications. This new form of RAM is said to absorb even more electromagnetic energy, upwards of 90%, while also being water-resistant, harder than sand, and able to stand up to extreme temperatures, as high as 3200 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, to give you a little bit of context about what a big deal that is, Parts of the SR-71 back near the afterburners would regularly see temperatures as high as 950 degrees when flying at speeds faster than Mach 3, and hypersonic aircraft regularly see temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees. That means this ceramic radar-absorbent material would not only work well for supersonic applications, it would even work for hypersonic ones. And while we're not necessarily talking about an aircraft for carrier duty, this would eliminate the problem we've seen with F-35Cs that seem to be very negatively affected by seawater. Using this material would allow for maintaining high supersonic speeds for as long as you want, while also reducing the maintenance requirements for each fighter by a huge margin. Now, if you were to use this new type of radar-absorbent material in conjunction with the other stealthier design elements that we've discussed, like active flow control to get rid of moving control surfaces or vertical tail sections, what we're really starting to talk about here is what could be the stealthiest fighter ever made. But what's important is that it could accomplish that without sacrificing much in the way of maneuverability. This aircraft could still be quite acrobatic, despite not doing it in the way we're used to seeing fighters do it. As I mentioned at the top, this is a huge story, in part because I had time to work on it, but also because there's just a lot that goes into designing a fighter. So let's close it here on our conversation about stealth, and we'll come back next week to discuss the advanced avionics systems, the next generation countermeasures that include things like laser-induced holograms, 
And we'll also talk about the drones that will fly alongside our notional air superiority fighter of the future. So for the first time ever, I guess we'll close on a to be continued. Please let me know if my audio sounds better now. I know some people have been complaining about the sound quality. I'm using an all new setup and I'm still learning. So let me know what you think. And on that ends another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.